Last time we looked at areas under curves and we had a look at areas that you had to consider as different parts, right? If you remember, the reason why we had to consider them as different parts, I'll just do a rough one here, is because you had different parts of the area, for example, that might have been above or below the axis. Do you remember that? Because integration, and this is actually going to become enormously useful for us later this lesson, integration takes into the count takes into account the fact that this area is beneath the axis. So it gives you back, it will return a negative number, right? So therefore, if what I actually want is just well, how much space is it, you have to look at this negative and say, I, I don't actually want it to be negative. I want to slap a minus sign on that so I get a positive. Positive, positive, that gives you a total area, okay? So therefore, we consider an area like this as two integrals. We do this little part here, and then we would do this part, and we treat them separately, okay? Uh, we call this integrating over separate intervals, right? So you'd maybe go from negative one to zero. There's your first interval. And then you go from zero to one, and you treat them separately, okay? Now, in a similar way, we're gonna look today at um, different kinds of areas that we also need to consider as two different pieces, but for a different reason, okay? For a more obvious reason, because you've got multiple curves flying around, okay? So this is just one curve, but it crosses the axis. This is when you've actually got two different graphs and we want to work out how they interplay together. So here's our first example. The area I'm interested in is this one underneath the curve, okay? So it's one little bounded area. I'm gonna color it in a second, so should you. But the reason I haven't colored it just yet is because even though it's one little bounded area, it really is actually two separate pieces that I'm going to consider separately, okay? So you can see there's a point of intersection here, right? And if you have a look to the left of this line, the left of this line, this area here, you can see that this is the area beneath what curve? Which curve is it? Yeah, good. It's underneath this curve. In fact, that area I just shaded in blue has nothing to do with the second curve, um, at least in terms of what line it's underneath. It does have something to do with that, that boundary there. But apart from that number, good morning, apart from that number, it's completely independent of this graph. Okay. Conversely, when you have a look at the second half there, I'm going to shade this in a different color. This green area has nothing to do with y equals x squared. It's not touching that graph at all. In fact, you could delete off y equals x squared in that green area. You could still define it very easily. Okay? So, blue, green, I'm going to call this one very originally area one. And we could call this one area two. How do I work out what this area is? Um, I need some boundaries, don't I, right? I need an upper bound and a lower bound. The lower bound's really easy, it's the lower bound. It's just zero, okay. How do I determine the upper bound? The midpoint between zero and two. Okay, so you've got some symmetry happening here, right? So you know that this root over here, good morning, is two, right? So I actually can make a symmetry argument and say, well, that should be right in the middle. However, I'm not actually going to do that in this case because, well, they're not often like that. You'll get completely different graphs that have no kind of symmetry you can take advantage of. This point up here that defines the upper bound is really the point of intersection between these two graphs, okay? So therefore, I'm just gonna solve for when this graph intersects with that one. That's not too complicated, okay? So let's quickly do that. I'll even write what I'm doing. The point of intersection uh, is when x squared is equal to x minus two, all squared. So if we quickly expand this out, and there's that number that you're already expecting because it is indeed halfway between zero and two. Okay, so now I know this has an x value. By the way, I was a bit naughty. Even though I said point of intersection, I actually don't need to know the y value, right? Why not? Because because yeah, yeah, very good. When I'm, when I'm integrating, I'm integrating with respect to the x-axis. So all I need are the x-boundaries, okay? So zero to one, that'll do me, right? Now I'm ready to form my integral. I'll do the first area. <coughs> the first area, like we said, is underneath x squared. So I integrate from naught to one. There are my boundaries. x squared dx. Simple. This is not complicated, okay? So what I need to know is the primitive function of x squared. The primitive of x squared is... x cubed on 3. Very good. I know from experience you're probably going to be still a little bit in, man, am I differentiating or integrating mode? Can I encourage you in these, it's still fairly early on in terms of our understanding of integration, 
um, that you just mentally check every time you do this, just go back and differentiate, right? Make sure you haven't accidentally differentiated from here to here. It's a very, bless you, common error, okay? Great, so now I've got my upper and lower boundaries. That's a third takeaway zero. So there's my first area, okay? Now, keeping in mind this symmetry that we were expecting before, I kind of have a guess as to what A2 is. But I don't have, like, it's not actually an even odd function or anything like that. So I don't have any explicit symmetry I can take advantage of in those terms. So I'm just going to evaluate the integral, right? What integral should I write? What are my boundaries? One to two. One to two, very good. And I'm going to be doing x minus two, all squared. Okay, now at this point you have a choice. Um, you can expand this thing. I already know what it's going to expand out to. And then you can integrate the terms one by one. So there's three terms, it's pretty manageable, okay? However, I don't have to expand. I don't have to expand. And it's in my interest to practice integrating this without expanding, just in case, you know, a question is a bit prickly and they give me a power that I cannot expand, that it's not practical to do. This is just as easy to integrate we're using a reverse chain rule as this is, if I'm careful with it, okay? Now, let me help you. Um, I'm gonna give you a bit of a tip for using a reverse chain rule because like I said, it takes a bit of a mind shift. We're pretty good at just doing it with, um, with an x term that's by itself, but when we see this, it gets a bit confusing, okay? So here's what I remember. There's a power two there. So I think we all know that this is coming from something which has a power of three. So that's gonna be the primitive, okay? Now if I had this, Right? If I was differentiating that, what would I get? What would happen? Three. Yeah, the three would come out front, very good. And then the power would reduce by one. Okay? So this is three something squared. And we're really used to seeing this because you've been differentiating for so long. If you saw something like this, um, 10, okay? Again, you're familiar with the pattern of the power comes out the front and the power reduces by one. Really, really familiar with that, okay? So something you can do here to compensate is to say, well, out the front there, there's kind of a number missing, right? There's the number that's bigger by one. Do you see that? Like this number is bigger by one, this number is bigger by one, okay? So here's what I'll do. I'll have that integral still there and I'll put the missing number there, three. So this came from something cute, but of course you can't just put in numbers because you like to put in numbers to make things easier to integrate. So in order to compensate for that three, I'm gonna put a one third out the front. So you can see this is kind of like the same thing we do with rationalizing a denominator. You multiply and divide by the same number, okay? And this compensates, this makes this in this easy form that I'm good at recognizing, okay? Um, and if it was a different power, I would multiply and divide by a different number. Okay, so once I've got this, that third, that just hangs out the front. And now I'm ready to state the primitive function, right? It's three something squared. So when I integrate out, what did I differentiate from? And the answer is something cubed, that's all. Okay, so there you go. More complicated, just an idea to help you. If you don't find that helpful, then don't worry about it. But I do find that as these guys in the middle get more and more complicated, this compensating idea becomes very, very useful. Yeah? What would happen if it was like 2x in the bracket? Ah, okay, great. That's a great idea. So for example, if I had started with this, uh, let's just make it um, that. Good morning. If I was starting with this, okay, I think two things. Number one, um, that's going to have to be a 3, that's where it came from, okay, so I'm expecting a 3 to be here, but because of the reverse chain rule, right, there should also be a 2, a 3 and a 2, so that's a 6 altogether, right, so I'm expecting this, right, that's what I'm expecting, but of course I can't have a, because when I, when I, if I started with, if I started with, I'm running out of space, if I started with this, 2x minus 1 cubed, right? I'm going to multiply by the 3. That's the 3 I had before. But then I also multiply by the 2, which would give me 6. So that's the 6 I'm kind of expecting. But of course, in order to have 6 there, I've got to compensate and have the 1 6 out the front. So there's a net change of 0, okay? Um, so this would work fine. This would be a 6, 2x minus 1 cubed. Plus a constant, because that's indefinite. Okay? So you don't need to times it by 2 or... <laughs> um, I have multiplied it by 2. 
Obviously. You see? So now, the, and again, the reason I can I know this is true is because just like I suggested over here, let's just take this guy and differentiate him to be sure, right? So that 3 will come out the front, and then the 2 will also come out the front, both of which will cancel this 1 sixth, which will give me exactly what I expected. Okay? So differentiation is going to be your acid test for did I get the right integral or not? And I'm going to encourage you as much as possible, mentally check back. Mentally check back because then you're doing both at the same time and you don't get stuck in one mode. You get used to changing between them because you do have to. Okay? Alright, I think I'm ready to integrate. Uh, sorry, I'm ready to evaluate. Yeah? So what am I going to get when I evaluate at my upper bound? Zero. Yeah, good, because I got 2 minus 2 cubed. Zero. What happens when I evaluate at my lower bound? Zero. I get, because I'm subtracting the lower bound, and of course minus uh, one cubed is minus one. Okay, is that all right? See how I got that? That was one minus two, negative one, all good. So there's my double negative, there's one. So there's the one third unit square that I was expecting from before because of this symmetry. Right. I've run out of space down here, but you know what to do to finish this off, right? The total area is, a1 plus A2, that's two-thirds square units. Okay, are you happy with that? And you can see how crucial it was to form my argument off of a diagram, right? Are oh, you sick of me saying this yet? Your diagram needs to be clear, so you can see where the point of intersection is and calculate it. Your diagram needs to be big enough, big enough, that you can divide it up into the different parts and you can distinguish them, okay? And you can also like name them and then use that in your work. Okay, 